Welcome to today's session on embedding environmental messages into your sessions. Um, today we have speakers, uh, myself, Kate Fortnum, the campaign manager for the Green Blue, and Phil Horton, the RWA planning and sustainability manager. Today's session, we're going to be covering the following, an introduction to the Green Blue programme, environmental best practice that you can embed into your courses, so building your knowledge up in anchoring best practice, decarbonising vessels, water pollution prevention, watch your waste, so looking at recycling there and waste disposal. And then we're going to introduce some instructor resources that you can use to help you pass on those messages, but also get your students involved in courses. And then at the end, there's going to be an opportunity for questions and feedback. So an introduction to the Green Blue. If you're not aware of the Green Blue already, the Green Blue is the joint environmental awareness programme between the RWA and British Marine. The aim of the Green Blue is to support the sustainable use of coastal and inland waters by UK recreational boating community for today and for future generations. The Green Blue does a variety of work and activities, including raising awareness, developing guidance and resources for the boating community on knowing how they can adopt best practice. Outreach work and we do that through talks, webinars, training and we also attend events and have stands such as the Dinghy Show and Southampton Boat Show. We also work very closely with government agencies and bodies um, such as Natural England and the Environment Agency to look at how we can work together to um, improve the uh, environment around us and make sure that our boating is sustainable as possible. We also look at developing partnerships and projects with other businesses, organisations that have similar aims and goals to us. And then we look at trying to raise awareness of sustainable products and services and facilities so the boating community know what alternatives there are to make sure that we're protecting um, our environment. So linking on from the partnerships and projects, I would like to introduce you to one of the main projects that the Green Blue and the RWA is involved in currently, and that is the Life Recreation Remedies Project, which is led by Natural England. You can see at the bottom of this slide here, there's a number of partners involved in this project, and it's looking at the protection and restoration of seabed habitats in five sites in the south of England. In particular, we're looking at the protection and restoration of seagrass habitats. And our involvement in the project is to raise awareness amongst the recreational boating community of sustainable anchoring and mooring practices to help protect them. So we're going to introduce you to a little bit around um, the impact that, that anchoring and mooring can have and then what you can do as an instructor to adopt whilst you're out on the water with your students, but also to pass on this best practice to them. So what I'm about to go through now can all be obtained in a new guide that we've developed, which is the Green Guide to Anchoring and Mooring. This comes in a digital form, but also as a hard copy that you can download and order for free from the Green Blue website. And you can see the website address at the bottom there. So this is a great resource to read yourself as an instructor, but also to pass on to your students. And as I said before, they're all free, so you can order a batch. So why are we concerned around anchoring and the protection of our seabed habitats? Unfortunately, um, through anchor drag and chain abrasion, these particular habitats can be damaged. And you can see from the images here where the chain, um, wh when the chain is pivoting around the anchor point, it is abrading the seabed and unfortunately it damages the fronds of um, the seagrass. We also have our traditional swing moorings um, which in themselves can cause scarring around the anchor block on the seabed. Um, on the left hand side here, you can see where that chain from the uh, mooring has abraded the seabed, but also in the image on the right here, it is um, from Google Maps and it's a bird's eye view of St Mary's Bay in the Isles of Scilly. And here you can just about make out um, scarring patches around the mooring blocks within a seagrass bed. So we know that this does cause an impact. But what can we do as boaters to help protect these seabed habitats? So the first thing is part of the project is we're trying to help the recreational boating community understand where the seagrass is to begin with. If we know where the seagrass areas are, we can then make an educated decision on where we will anchor or not anchor to minimise damage. 
So the Remedies Project has its own website. It's called saveourseabed.co.uk. I recommend going there to find out more information about the project, but also they have seagrass maps um, on the site. So as a boater, you can go on there and have a look at the five sites the project's focusing on and see where your anchorage spot might have seagrass located. Other things that the project is doing is looking at putting marker buoys on the surface of the water. So as boaters, when we approach an anchorage point, we know that there's seagrass there and then we can make a choice to anchor outside of that. There's already one being put in place down at Jenny Cliff Bay in Plymouth, um, and it's proved to be very effective in informing the boating community, and we've seen boaters anchoring outside of it. So that's really, really positive. Um, currently, we're looking at developing and improving upon these maps to go on digital charts, but in the meantime, there is an online interactive map that the Marine Conservation Society developed, and it's called Reality Check. So if you type that into um, any of your search engines um, and you can go on there and select seagrass and it will bring up seagrass areas around the coast. It doesn't have them all though, hence why we are building on developing improved maps for you as boaters. So in development currently, we're going to be putting up signs at marinas and posters of these maps. So boaters know where their local seagrass areas are before setting out um, to choose an anchorage or to pop, uh, pop by and stay somewhere for lunch. Um, the nautical charts that we're going to be developing um, is going to have the seagrass areas on and we're hoping to make those available on the Green Blue website, but also the project website going forwards. And Imre publications have been very supportive and they're interested in putting in information on their in their piloted books and on their paper charts, um, indicating where seagrass is um, when you're intending to visit. So once we know where the seagrass is, we can then choose to anchor or moor away. So that's the second thing that you must do. So try and find an alternative anchorage. If you can't, then please use an existing mooring within that seagrass area. The existing mooring has already caused um, a small amount of damage there. Um, so it's better than dropping the anchor and creating a new fresh patch of damage. And even better, if there is an available advanced eco mooring system, so this is a mooring system that is designed to minimise chain abrasion and also the impact an anchor has, which is what the project's also looking into, um, then please moor to that. Then finally, if you've got no other option but to anchor in seagrass, then here's some top tips for you to adopt and to pass on to your students. The first thing is avoid anchor drag. So you'll know as an RA instructor that you will be passing on this information anyway to ensure the safety of your vessel. So choosing the correct type of anchor, if we're looking at seagrass beds, then it's sand. So looking at an anchor that's going to embed quickly and, and hold. And then periodically checking at the positioning of our vessel. So the normal kind of RA um, information that you'll be passing on to your students has a secondary benefit in protecting our seabed habitats. And then another crucial element is ensuring that the anchor chain is kept at a minimum. By keeping the anchor chain at a minimum, it um, reduces the amount of area that the chain is going to be abrading on the seabed. Now, you may recognise this diagram from your instructor handbooks, but the RWA recommends that looking at the maximum depth of water, you should be using four times that amount of chain or if you're using a mixture of chain and warp, then six times the depth. Now, every vessel obviously is different and you'll know what your vessel should have in terms of minimum chain deployed. But the idea is what we're trying to communicate here is use the minimum amount possible. Why is that? On the next slide here, we've got a diagram to help demonstrate that if you have, for example, six metres of chain lying on the seabed, so that's in contact with the seabed, it can cause potentially 130 metres squared abrasion area. Now, let's say we just add a couple of more um, extra metres of chain lying on the seabed to make it eight metres. It goes up to 201 metres squared. So that's nearly double just by two extra metres being added. So this tells us as boaters, small changes we can make in chain length can have a really positive effect in helping to minimise our impact on the seabed. And these are great tips that you can pass on to your, um, your students. 
The other thing is, um, depending on the type of vessel, you can see in the picture on the left hand side here, we recommend um, helping crew on the foredeck count out the amount of chain that they have, either using markers on the chain, so you can mark them periodically or flaking the chain out onto the foredeck ready to deploy. This keeps the accuracy. If you have an auto automatic um, anchor deploy, you can even be more accurate because it will tell you exactly how much chain is being deployed. So that is anchoring and mooring best practice. I did want to make you aware that we are running um, a series of webinars specifically focusing on this with more detail around the importance of seagrass. So do go to the Green Blue website and look at our join our webinars web page and you can sign up to those um, and we're running a series of those across the sp spring period. The other thing I would love you to be able to do is um, enter into our prize draw, but also complete this very mini survey that we have online and the link is here on the slide. So just type that into your search engine and you can go and complete it. And it only takes about three to five minutes and we will enter you into a prize draw if you provide your name and email address. And that helps to give a little bit of feedback on what you've just learned. Um, I'm now delighted to pass you over to Phil Horton, who is going to cover decarbonising of vessels. So over to you, Phil. Thanks, Kate. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, decarbonisation, particularly of propulsion. Um, so this quote on the, the RYA's vision comes from our Carbon Pathway to Zero. So we published that uh, last year, 2021, um, and it covers the whole of the recreational boating sector. So not just what the RYA does. Um, so what I'm going to talk about here is that kind of wider, wider impact of, of boating, of recreational boats. So we've got some real challenges with, um, with, with boating, with the boating sector in terms of decarbonisation. And this is kind of a demonstration of, of one of those key, key issues, really. So if you go and buy a new car today, then in 10 to 15 years, it'll no longer be on the road. But if you went to the Southampton Boat Show last September and you bought yourself a new cruising yacht or cruising power boat, then it would be lasting for maybe 40, 50, even 60 years. And so we've got to start thinking about how those boats will convert to a, a, a decarbonised world. Uh, one of the real challenges is that by the time we get to the 2040s, with the decarbonisation of road transport, it's going to become increasingly difficult to get hold uh, of fossil fuels anyway. Um, so regardless of the environmental concerns that we have, we also need to think about the, the practicalities in, in the long term as well. So we do need to, to look at the kind of existing boat fleet as well as, as, well as new boats. And the other major challenge we have is the huge range of, of use cases we have uh, within boating. So if we think about you know, planing motorboats, they, they tend to go at high speed, not necessarily have a, a very long range. Uh, if you've got a, a cruising uh, monohull sailing boat, then you, you'll be looking at a, a long range, but, but very low speed. And then we also have some vessels, some large di displacement uh, motor yachts that have both high range, high speed and, and long range requirements. So we haven't got one uh, solution to all of these. We're going to have to have multiple solutions to, to sort out the problems across the range of boats that we have. So we've got to really think about how we use our boats. Um, speed is absolutely critical to the power requirements and range. I mean, I looked at our, uh, my own Vancouver 27. It has a, a natural hull speed of around six and a half knots. If you're going to drive that with an electric motor, it would take about 12 kilowatts in, in flat water. If I go along at three to four knots, then it uses one and a half kilowatts. So we've got to really think about you know, how we manage our boats, how we drive them and how we use them. What do you really need? How fast do you actually travel most of the time? And what range do you, do you cover in, in typical use? Uh, I mean, I'm based in the Hamble. A lot of the boats here will motor out of the Hamble and then they'll sail around uh, within the Solent and then they'll motor back in again if you're a sailing boat. And for motor boats, they similarly, they don't generally go very far. And people probably don't boat every day either, you know, just weekends in the summer for, for a lot of people. So we don't then even need, in terms of the infrastructure, we don't even need high speed charging for a lot of these boats if we switch them to electric. You could uh, plug your boat in when you get back to the marina, go onto an app and say, I'd like to use my boat next Saturday at 11 a.m. Uh, and leave the, the automatic systems to charge it, to trickle charge that boat during the week. So we've got to really think about how we use our boats. Um, and that is probably some information that will be useful to your um, to your students as well. OK, so my thinking is and, and the RWA is thinking more generally is that eventually everything will go to electric drive. It has huge benefits beyond the environmental. 
uh, so that it's quiet. Uh, you have much more control. You can just have a little tiny bit of motor on. You don't have that kind of sudden lurch as you put a boat into gear where it lurches forwards or backwards. You can go as slowly as you like. Uh, and on this slide, we've got a, a few of the kind of already existing products that are out there. You can already buy uh, a, a, an outboard for various sizes for different types of, of application. The, the second photo there is of an electric motor on a narrowboat. You can get pod drives, you can even get rudder um, mounted electric drives uh, that, are, that are available at the moment. And my feeling is that that's the way things will go. They're really easy to maintain, very low maintenance requirements. Effectively, you've got a single moving part in most of these devices. Next slide. So the question then is, what do you use as your energy source? Uh, and so for the, the shorter range and even for high speed, if you've got a, a short range, then I think a, a battery electric will be the way we go at the moment. That is mostly lithium ion batteries. That technology is developing rapidly. The type of devices we put into boats uh, are very low risk in terms of fire. They're not the same technology that currently goes into cars um, and they have a reasonable energy density. They, they can discharge fully and recharge without damaging the battery, unlike current lead acids. So although you might think the capacity uh, is, is a challenge, um, the actual usability of it, of, of the whole battery capacity is there already. Uh, and you can, uh, the engines are very efficient, the, the transfer of energy into the electric motor is very efficient, so it, it, you get a surprising range out of existing electric drives. For longer range, I suspect that everything will go eventually over to hydrogen propulsion. Uh, so on the left hand side of this slide, you'll see a, a hydrogen tank. You can actually burn the hydrogen in an internal combustion engine, but it's just not very efficient. So ultimately, I suspect we will have electric motor drive and we'll have a, a hydrogen fuel cell. Uh, the really important thing here is that we get some guidance from industry that, that helps us uh, select for the future what we um, what technologies are going to come to the fore because we need to be able to go anywhere around the coast and pick up our energy supplies. So here's a few examples of uh, existing boats. So in sailing yachts, it's quite easy for the auxiliary engine already to be electric drive. There's no reason why all new electric, uh, all new uh, sailing yachts couldn't have electric drive already. There are a few electric power boats around. Some of those are foiling to make them more efficient. You can already buy an electric personal watercraft jet ski. Uh, top right there is a, is a narrow boat uh, that can run all day just on the solar panels on the roof. It doesn't even use the battery power during the summer. Uh, and then in the centre at the bottom is a hybrid vessel, so diesel electric. Uh, and bottom right is, is me with my, my small tender on the handle uh, with a, a one kilowatt electric outboard that works very well uh, as a yacht tender. Slide. And then in terms of, of safety boats, um, there's quite a lot of products out there already. So top left is the, the new RS electric, uh, which you know it's very expensive at the moment. It's kind of the Tesla end of the market, but the prices will come down. It's going to have quite substantial range, very stable boat uh, and very useful actually for, for coaching because with the silent uh, engine, then you can coach quite easily with, with the motor on uh, when you're moving. Obviously, when you stop, it stops using any energy and it stops all the noise completely. Uh, and as I've said already, there are various outboard engines already on the market and there are two or three new products coming out in this coming year, uh, which are increasing the efficiency and the usability for, for longer range for those boats. But again, we need to think about how we use them. If you're out there coaching and instructing a, a small group of, of Optimist dinghies, then you probably can get away with the existing technologies. You could have a small electric outboard. If you're coaching a, a foiling catamaran, then it might be a, a different question and you might have to wait a little longer until the technology gets there to catch up with your requirements. In the interim, for certainly for diesel engines, there are some good biofuel alternatives. So HVO fuel is the one that's most talked about at the moment. And it's a, a true drop in replacement for diesel. It's not like the first generation biofuels that caused various problems with diesel bug and, uh, and clogging up the fuel systems. This is a true drop in replacement. It's been tested across a whole range of engines. It's now available on the Thames and it'll be increasingly available, we hope, in, in marinas around the coast. Um, so in terms of what we think it'll look like in terms of the, the emissions reductions, this, this is kind of looking at 100%, almost 100% fossil fuels at the moment. Um, out to 2030, I think we will see an increase in the use of biofuels in that interim phase as electric and, uh, and uh, battery electric and hydrogen electric uh, systems develop. 
And then as we head out to 2050, when we've got to get to net zero, we'll see a huge increase in that electrification, as we're seeing at the moment on, on the roads. Uh, that will transfer into the marine sector as well. And for the longer range and, and higher power requirements, I think we'll see that increase in the use of hydrogen, which is a green fuel if it's made from renewables, which is where we'll, we'll get to probably in the late 2030s, early 2040s. So kind of in conclusion on that, uh, just a, a brief run through of, of, of where we are at the moment. Speed is absolutely critical to power requirements and range and how you actually use your boat is key to decisions about decarbonising. There are many advantages to switching to electric in addition to the environmental benefits. That's noise is reduced, level of control you get is increased, the level of maintenance is reduced and reliability is increased. So there's a whole host of advantages to it apart from uh, the environmental benefits. There are options already out there on the market that make sense for some applications and for others. We just need to plan ahead considering the lifetime of our boats and think about um, what we need to do to convert them over the next 10 to 15 years. I think most solutions for all of those applications will become viable in the next two to five years. It's just important to think ahead and look ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, Phil. Um, OK, we're now going to move on to um, water pollution prevention. So um, we're not going to be able to cover everything in this session, but um, do visit the Green Blue website to find out more details. But I'm going to cover a little bit on anti-foul, um, applying and removing, um, and also some alternatives. We're going to look at grey water, um, minim minimising discharge, and what can we actually use on board to be more sustainable, and then oil and fuel use. So anti-fouling best practice, um, we do have a campaign called Protect, Collect, Dispose in March. So sort of leading up to that season of preparing our boats um, for sailing. Um, and we want to be looking at how we're removing our existing anti-fouling and applying it. So the best practice is to ensure that we're protecting the ground. And an easy way of doing that is putting a tarpaulin down. So as you're moving around the vessel underneath and you're working, um, that tarpaulin will capture any paint spills, um, drips, but also when you're removing any debris. And then you can collect that debris up to dispose of safely in hazardous waste bins. We also recommend if you're doing work on your boat to do it away from um, surface water drains. If you're not sure which drains are surface water or which ones are going to the sewage works, then please ask your boat yard or marina or your central club um, where you're located and, and they can get plans for you. We also recommend when you're applying your paint to use a roller, it reduces the drips and spills. Obviously, you will need to use um, a paintbrush in some areas. And then to reduce um, airborne particles of anti-foul um, going into the air and then, of course, into the wider environment, but also minimising the amount that you're inhaling, um, is to use a wet sand and then also a vacuum to extract that. Of course, wear your PPE gear, really important for your own health and safety. And then any um, anything that you've used that either has paint contaminated on it or the actual paint pots themselves, you need to make sure that they're disposed of in hazardous waste bins. Um, the green blue, we do have a tool on the website called the UK Environmental Facilities Map, and that allows you to go and search for marinas, harbours and boatyards that have waste disposal and what type of waste they actually collect. So that's a really useful tool for you to go and have a look at. In terms of anti-foul runoff um, and capturing when we're power spraying, there are some um, devices, but also installations that marinas can put in place. And we recommend actually going to one of these marinas, boatyards or harbours that have one of these. And if your local marina um, doesn't have one, then please do recommend that they have a look into installing one. So the first thing here, we've got an image on the left hand side. This is actually Phil's vessel um, getting power sprayed at Deacon's Marina on the handball. And what they've got is a concrete bunded washdown area. So the vessel is lifted over this area here and you can see a small concrete um, bunded wall going around the edge. And then the in the middle, there is a drain. So as the vessel is getting power sprayed, it removes the biofouling, but unfortunately there is contaminated anti-foul residue in there as well if you're using um, a paint with that in. What happens is the residue will enter into um, the grated grill you can see in the centre bottom here, um, and there's gravel systems, so it filtrates out the sort of heavy anti-foul flex, and then the remaining water goes back into the marina. The great thing about these is it also corrects, collects biofouling, which may contain invasive species. On the right hand side, um, you can see a slipway here with a drainage channel. So this is something else that can be put in place. So um, when you're power spraying on a slipway, 
the water will run off into this drain and then it will go away into a settlement tank to later then be cleaned um, by the site. Um, some other examples, um, you can actually have portable um, bunded filtered washdown areas. So here on the left hand side, it's basically a mat that the boat gets put over the top of. Um, it's bunded around the sides, as you can see, and it will collect that water residue and it's pumped out. Um, this is actually being used as particular pictures from um, Falmouth Harbour Commissioners. Um, so they've got that in place and because it's portable, it means they can move it out of the way um, and potentially move it between sites as well. So you can see an image in the top right hand here where that paint residue has been collected. So it's great to see that that is being um, disposed of correctly rather than going straight into our water. And then in the bottom right hand corner here, this is something called a filter bun. So it's a filter mat. Um, so the boats are lifted up, power sprayed, um, and again, the water filters through this mat um, and is piped off. And this is actually at Emsworth Yacht Club, uh, sorry, Yacht Harbour. So what else can we do? We've obviously, if you're using paint, that's the best practice that you can adopt. But why not look at alternatives that don't have anti-foul paint? So some of the things that you may consider um, and your students can consider is choosing a low level or non biosound anti-foul paint and of course contact the paint providers um, and get their recommendations um, and range from that. Other options are using silicon and vinyl, so they're sheets that are placed on the bottom of the boat. Um, you can see an image here on the left hand side. Um, this is actually our, the chair of the RWA's boat, Chris Preston. So he's put this on the bottom of his boat and he's absolutely raving about it because He's winning, it seems to be winning a lot of races from it, whether it's from the silicon or not, he doesn't quite know, um, but he, he's very pleased with it. And he says, all you have to do is do a quick wipe down and it removes the biofouling or, um, or a gentle spray, as you can see here. Then there's also biomimetic um, anti-fouling coatings that you can put on. So Finchulate in the middle there, you can see, so it kind of replicates a sea anemone surface. Um, a lot of aquatic species will naturally have surface areas that are deterrents from algae growth and what some manufacturers are doing is using it, replicating those surfaces and seeing if we can then apply these coatings to the hull of our boat. Um, Finchulay, um is being, again, it, um, found with harbour commissioners, they're putting that onto their harbour boats, so we're looking forward to seeing results from that um, and also a private owner on the Hamble River is also putting that on and um, from the our ways point of view and the green blue we're looking at developments in this area and um, further providing research and information to the boat user. There's also ultrasonification so up in the top right hand corner here is um, the contraption which fixes to the hull of the boat from the inside and it sends different frequencies and vibrations out. And some species don't like certain vibrations on the hull and they won't attach essentially. Um, and the, the sort of upper range models will have more variety of frequencies um, to, deter, to, to, to deter certain species or in, uh, more variety. And then we've got copper coat. So copper in itself um, is toxic to um, um, species, um, hence why they won't attach to it. Um, but the good thing about copper coat is it is more durable and lasts a lot longer than um, the average paints and it has been seen to last up to 10 years. So here we're looking at savings of having to lift out our boat annually and repainting. Um, and Phil um, is actually going through the process with his vessel of putting copper coat on. So if you do have any questions at the end about that, then I'm sure he'd be more than happy to answer those. So that just gives you um, an overview. So now grey water runoff. Um, when we're on board, we need to be making sure we're using eco-friendly cleaning products. And what we mean by that is looking at the ingredients labels and making sure that there's no phosphates in there. Phosphates is a plant nutrient, but if the water ends up with excess nutrients in, unfortunately, we then get algae growth, which you can see in the bottom right hand picture. And the algae growth um, can spread over the surface of the water and it blocks sunlight out, preventing other species from growing and photosynthesizing. Then eventually, once that algae uses up all that excess phosphate, it dies off and the bacteria in the water that breaks down and de decomposes that algae uses up oxygen in the water. And then, of course, that's going to impact on aquatic life that survives on oxygen. It's also been found that, um, especially in the Chichester Emsworth Harbour, um, a lot of the mud flats are covered with an algae and it's found that um, a lot of the bird species find it difficult to find 
their food within the mud flats when there is that covering of algae on top. So these are other sort of side impacts that we want to avoid. So other things naturally avoid chlorine, bleach, so checking the labels there, and also avoiding microplastics. A really good ingredient to look out for is polyethylene um, on the back. If you see that, it means it has plastics in. Now oils and fuels. So how can we first of all prevent spills on board and also clean them up? So here are a few gadgets um, and devices that you can use on board or install, um, or you can recommend to your training centre to maybe get them to install it onto their vessels. So first of all, you want to be making sure that um, the engine is being maintained and fuel lines to prevent leaks. We're doing regular checks there. Um, and then using suitable containers. Um, I've seen all sorts of things at marinas put next to the oil disposal sites, which is great that they're being disposed of correctly, but things like uh, milk cartons, which can easily um, leak, but also if they fall over, um, it can also cause spillages. So making sure we're using the correct containers. A great device, which um, you know is highly recommended, is fitting a bilge filter on board. So in the bottom right hand corner here, you can see a bilge filter is fitted into the pump line of the bilge. So what happens here is a bit like a water filter. It'll extract any contaminants or oil out of the bilge water before it's pumped out into the open water. Now bilge filter um, here, this one here is created by Wavestream and they've actually found that some microplastics can be taken out as well. So it has a, another benefit there, which they've recently discovered. The other thing is an oil fuel collar. You can see that on the fuel nozzle at the top here. Um, and this is so when you're refueling, sometimes um, we'll get blowback up the air, um, sorry, up the fuel line, and then the fuel will drip down the side of the boat. So how can we prevent that? Well, putting on this fuel collar, it's a bit like a donut, um, it'll absorb the oil, if any um, of it, or fuel as it comes back up and captures that. And it prevents it dripping into the water onto the pontoons. So um, in terms of cleaning up spills, we recommend always having an oil spill kit on board just in case. Ask your marina um, where you're at the fueling station if they have any cleanup or absorbent pads to use. Again, using a bilge sock, um, which is also an absorbent um, pad. You can see one in the spill kit at the top here. So it's kind of like a sausage shape that can lie underneath the engine or any um, drip tray and absorb any oil. This is especially probably an alternative for if you've got a brand new engine or boat compared to maybe a bilge filter. And then another way is using a siphon pump. So you can actually pump the water out, especially if it's contained within a chamber that doesn't have um, a bilge pump. And that's what you can see in the bottom left hand corner here. So that's a device that your centre could have a few of those on board and through the kind of maintenance, extract that um, out. And then finally, looking at waste on board. Um, so I've been on a few um, our way courses and also pops on board um, at some training centres to look at how we can support them in becoming more sustainable. Um, some great practice, which I have seen when I've been out and about, is um, having separate bins on board. So having a general waste bin and then also a recycling bin. Um, and some training centres I've visited have actually had compost bins on as well, which is fantastic to, to separate food out. Um, also, there's been the use of compostable bags. Um, obviously, if there's a lot of wet things going on there, they're not as durable. But as we know on our way courses, they're only for short periods of time, maybe um, a day, a weekend or a week. Um, so in terms of that, you know, they're more than appropriate. Try and avoid products with um, plastic packaging on where possible. Um, remove that and try and recycle it. Put it into the recycling bin on board. Again, if you're not sure where recycling facilities are around our coastline or on inland waters, we've got our UK environmental facilities map, which I'm going to show you an image of shortly. Um, try and use reusable items on board. Um, and wash them up. So I have seen um, paper plates being used because it's easy just to quickly dispose of them at the end of a course, but please try um, and use reusable cutlery, drink bottles, etc. And then try and purchase food in bulk. So instead of separate sandwiches for each of the students on board, try and buy um, you know, a whole loaf of bread and get people to make their sandwiches instead. And this will help reduce on the amount of packaging that you're using.
instructor and student resources. So we've gone through there a little bit about knowledge build up for you and um, on some of that best practice for yourself. But then now you can look at embedding that within your course naturally as you're talking about anchoring, as you're talking about refueling the engine or engine maintenance. We're, what we're looking at is getting you to try and just put in these um, environmental messages as you go along rather than an add on or a separate thing at the end of your course. So we've developed some resources to help you as instructors, but also your students. So the first thing is our UK environmental facilities map. So if you go onto the Green Blue website under resources, you'll find this under the boat user resources. Click on that and then you can explore around the UK and click on either harbours, um, marinas or boatyards that are registered and you can reveal whether they have recycling, whether they have pump out for black water disposal, um, Elson points, hazardous waste um, water refill, and that's not even just fresh water on the pontoons, that's actual water refill bottle points, and also whether they've got a filtered bunded washdown. Um, we have a series of webinars, so after this one, you can go and view past ones on the website. And like I said before, we've got upcoming ones with more detail on sustainable anchoring and mooring. But essentially, you could play some of these shorter videos um, during your on um, shore based courses. Um, to your students during a lunch break, for example, or generally is just part of your course. We also have um, an array of green guides. So these are our sort of four main ones at the moment. So we've got a coastal guide um, and loads of top tips. Now on the far right hand side here, you can see um, we've taken in an insight into what it looks like on one of the pages. So it generally introduces what the issue is and then there's bullet pointed top tips. So this is great for you as an instructor to build your own knowledge up, but if you can provide these guides to each of your students, they can read through those and pick up um, information themselves. If you want a batch of these to hand out on your courses, you can request them from the Green Blue for free from our website. We've also got a great selection of posters that you could display at your training centre or even on board. So students can refer to them or you as an instructor can refer to them and, and it helps promote discussion, get some thinking. And then finally, one of our most popular instructor resources is our quiz cards um, and activity cards. So essentially, it's like a deck of cards that you can keep in your pocket or on board. I mean, it's a really great one to do at lunchtime or when you've got some spare time with your students and you can just flick through the cards. There's questions on one side and answers on the other, and it's all around the environment and best practice. Um, and then the, in the orange cards, you can see there's some little quick fun filler activities, for example, walking around a vessel and identifying what impacts that vessel could have and then getting your students to come back and tell you what kind of impacts. And then as a group discussing what um, best practice could we adopt to maybe minimise that impact? So that's really getting your students to think about what the answers are. But of course, you as an instructor can prompt them because you've either read the guides and you've read through the cards yourself. 